I was diagnosed with MS in 2010 at the age of 25. The day before I was told I have MS, I was just a normal guy that had kind of some numb legs. And then they tell me I have MS and just those two words changed everything. My name is Stephanie and I was diagnosed with relapse remitting MS in 2012. I am a stay-at-home mom now, and I'm also a volunteer for my church. Before I was diagnosed with MS, I knew nothing about MS. I knew that it stood for multiple sclerosis. That's really about all I knew about MS. When the doctor diagnosed me um, with MS, he sat me down with my mother and he told me, okay, Ms. Immunis, our conclusion is this is what you have. I sort of laughed because I told doctor, can you speak to me in English because I really don't know what is MS. I've been having numbness in my legs. Uh, they attribute it to a pinched nerve. They followed up with even more MRIs, which revealed lesions. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I thought this is going to be fine, I'm going to be okay. And my doctor walked in and she touched my hand and she said, the radiologist suspects multiple sclerosis. I was overwhelmed from that moment. The last thing was the spinal tap that they came to the conclusion that this is what you have, this is multiple sclerosis. Hmm. Multiple sclerosis or MS. Well, no one knows exactly how many people have MS. According to the world map of MS prevalence, there are over 2.5 million people worldwide, of which approximately 5,000 of them are in South Africa. It's estimated that between 8 and 10,000 children under the age of 18 also live with MS. Most people with, living with MS rather, are diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 50, with more than twice as many women as men being diagnosed with the disease, we're told. Whilst MS cannot be cured yet, Progress in research to find a cure is very encouraging. Now, May is International Multiple Sclerosis Awareness Month. Now, it is to promote an understanding of the scope of this disease and to assist those with MS in making educated decisions about their health care. So our topic for today, then, is multiple sclerosis or just MS. And to help us unpack this, we have an expert panel comprised of a specialist neurologist, the Inland Chairperson of MS South Africa, or MSSA, and she's also living with MS herself. And we also have somebody else to share his personal story of MS with us. Now, you can tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply just interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. So sit back, relax, and learn from this bumper show ahead. Coming to you just after a small break. I'm Dr. Salam Muttaung, and this is Health Talk. So, does your medical scheme cover you when you need it? The smart choice is a medical scheme that plays ball. My parents didn't just get a medical aid. They got medical paid. Seven Bryce Bees SABC News. Look. Paul Barber, SABC News, London. Devon Mokobo, SABC, Ufa, Kotamono, Russia. Neha Punya, SABC News, Saharanpur in Uttar Pradesh in India. Other than that, I've enjoyed every single moment of it. SABC News, Soweto, Johannesburg. Our stories. How do I begin? Our lives. When all seems to fail, 
we will raise our voices a bit louder for our justice. Well, I went into absolute shock. My whole body was shaky. I couldn't hold a phone, but there he was. I couldn't believe the nonchalant that they were still in the area two weeks later. And in times when the justice system is not able to help us with our individual battles. I'm willing to do anything. What are you doing? Nothing. Feeling sort of fair. Something no, it's not an option. These are stories on Cutting Edge Channel 404. Meet Ruth Tladi, a young girl from the Free State. Growing up, life was pretty normal for her until she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Before I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, I had a normal life. I can say that. Um, not that it's not normal now, but I was just in my high school in the Free State in Bethlehem. I was doing high school there and then I had a pretty normal childhood. You know, sometimes life was a bit hard, you know, not having parents and getting sick and not knowing what is what sometimes. But I had my relatives, especially my aunt, who was always with me holding my hand throughout the whole experience. So then came 2009 when I got so sick and nobody knew what was wrong with me. Doctors kept telling me that I have uveitis, and I was like, what is that? Because I was blind, I couldn't see, and I was worried. Multiple sclerosis is an unpredictable, often disabling disease of the central nervous system, and it interrupts the flow of information within the brain and between the brain and the body. Multiple sclerosis symptoms differ, Unfortunately for Ruth, MS left her partially blind. She explained some of the symptoms she had. You have numbness, uh, back pain, like can be severe. You have scarring on your brain. Um, it's just, you sometimes forget what you want to say. Um, you have restless feet. Having to explain MS to people can be tricky. One can only describe it using their symptoms. I had to do research first about all these diseases and I just found some of them, like some of the explanations that I found, they just didn't make sense. Even today some of them still don't make sense. The only way I explain multiple sclerosis to somebody is through my experience, how it affects me. Ruth was depressed <laughs> as she was going in and out of hospital not knowing what is wrong with her. And getting support from her family was also difficult because they did not know how to assist her. My life had to change, first of all. Um, I just wanted to be alone. I was always this depressed. I had anxiety attacks most of the time. I was a hospital baby, if I may say so, because almost every week I'm at the hospital. Medication is not just working well with me because having different diseases like this, um, it's not easy to be treated at the hospital. So a lot of things had to change, unfortunately. And my family, um, they had a hard time accepting this because they couldn't understand what is this. I mean, we black, we from like RC, and these are just big words to some of us. According to Ruth, if only people could get tested in time, she thinks MS would be prevented early. If only it was possible for us to get tested, you know, you have these symptoms and you don't know what it is that you do, and then you can't even afford um, going to a private hospital and then saying, hey, I have this and this and this, can I be checked uh, if this is what I have or not? All right, so let's unpack these big words, multiple sclerosis or just MS. And to help us do this, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome in our Johannesburg studio, Professor Girish Moody. Now, Prof. Moody is head of neurology at Wurz University. Welcome to Health Talk. Once Thank you. Me. Thank you, Sela. Thank All you. All right. Let's unpack this. I mean, in the clip yeah, there, she says, you know, it's, uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's difficult to explain it, they say. What, yeah. what is this? So, so let's take the, the words multiple sclerosis. Sclerosis is cars. Yeah. So when it was first described in 1868 by, by the famous French neurologist who we call, you know, we 
neurologists have to worship someone. And so he's our little god of neurology, right. Jean-Martin Charcot, who okay. described many, many things. So he did these autopsies in those days, and they found these gray scars. And that coined the term multiple, because there were multiple and scar tissue right. in the brain. And that's how the term multiple sclerosis arose. Right. And this is the disease we now know. Yeah. When we think about it, it's evolved from then, from the first recognition in the Western world. It, it's been there for forever, we think. Yeah. And it's basically an autoimmune disease. All right. Right. So, I mean, when we think of autoimmune diseases, we think of diabetes, we can think of lupus or systemic lupus erythematosus, right. all those things. This is the same thing. It's an autoimmune disease right. in which your immune system yeah. is attacking your central nervous system. And this is the key to it. It only affects the brain, optic nerves, and spinal cord, your central nervous system. Right. So the peripheral nerves don't get affected in MS. Right? The rest of the body, your heart, lungs, kidneys, right. nothing gets affected. Okay, so we're going like to come back of, to that because, yeah. uh, you know, obviously let's start with um, how it happens. But before that, you say that it spans over many, many, many decades. Yeah. Do we know the actual prevalence? Yeah, that's the most amazing thing. We don't. Yeah. We do know what we do know is that it's much, much commoner in certain parts of the world. Right. So if you, if you look at the equator and then you look at the tropical and the, you know, the, the, the northern hemisphere, mm. that's where we see it. Mm. So we see it in Europe, especially as you go further north. We see it in North America. And, and we see it in Australia, but I think the Australia is the migration from, from the UK. Mm. So even in the UK, if you, if you take England, South England, less as you go higher to Scotland, more. Mm. If you look at Norway, Finland, uh, all those areas, very high prevalence. You go to North America, Canada, very high prevalence. So it seems to be related to the colder climates. It we, seems and in to, South Africa? So we're coming to that. And it seems to be related primarily to what we call Caucasian white people. Right. So if you look at your ancestral groups, you have the Caucasians, the Negroes, the uh, Aborigines. Those are the original sort of ethnic uh, classifications. Mm. And it seems to be related predominantly to Caucasian white people. Mm. Obviously, it does occur in the other groups. Like all diseases, they don't read the books. Mm. So they don't <laughs> obey the rules. They right? don't choose, yeah. They don't choose. Yeah. And we think that the reason we're seeing it in South Africa is the same thing, the migration from Europe or of the Dutch, the French, bringing the disease to this country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th that's where we see. Now, in terms of numbers, your number is correct. There's about 2.8 million people in the world mm. with MS. In South Africa, we don't have exact numbers, but our numbers, in fact, we did the study on this, our numbers are indirectly linked to the use of treatments for MS. And that's how we came up with the figure of approximately 5,000, okay. plus minus. Okay. So we did an indirect assessment. It's very hard. I mean, you really need a nationwide study to try and find it. The problems, as we will discuss in this program, are diagnosis uh, and confirmation of diagnosis, etc., before you can just say it. there may have been overdiagnosis or even underdiagnosis, and so the numbers are not right. Okay, let's come but back then to how, how it actually happens. You mentioned scarring. I mean, yeah. where d does it, you know, occur okay, in stages? So, yeah. So it's an autoimmune disease, and what we think first and foremost happens is something goes wrong with your immune system. T cells, you know, in, in your blood you have B cells, T cells. The mm. T cells somehow breach the blood brain barrier. And this is where we, we know that that happens, because when you do your lumbar puncture, the protein is elevated, which tells you that your blood-brain barrier, the thing that protects the brain from the rest of the world, mm. is breached. It's inflamed. Mm. So these T cells seem to be crossing, a, going across, sending signals to the, to the cells in the brain, which we call the microglia, mm. which then start releasing things that damage the neurons. Mm. So you get a whole inflammation. And that inflammation is what we call the plaque of MS. And that plaque, if it's not treated, yeah. becomes a scar. Okay. And this can occur in different sites. So depending on where it is, mm. that's your symptom. So some people will have a plaque in the motor cortex and they'll have a paralysis. Yeah. Some will have a plaque in the, in the cerebellum 
and they'll become imbalanced or ataxic. The common ones are in the optic nerve and that's where your first symptom usually arises and you get loss of vision or you get loss of color vision or you get pain and so you get what we call the optic neuritis. Mm. So technically it's quite simple from the point of view of you've got an unidentified factor that triggers an inflammation in the brain. Mm. This produces little plaques. Depending on where the plaque in the brain is, that's where your presentation will, will arise. So there's nothing like typical symptoms of MS? There are common symptoms. Right. So the common symptoms are the visual symptoms. Right. So people present with either diplopia, which is double vision, or they present with loss of vision. Mm. Imbalance, where you, you, you lose your balance, the ataxia. Then the other one is numbness, like the one clip you showed, where people lose sensation or feelings in their, in their legs. Yeah. A very common symptom is you bend your neck and you get like an electrical tingle running down the spine. Very, uh, another very important symptom is fatigue. And this fatigue usually comes after a warm bath. And in fact, you ask MS patients and they will all tell you heat is a very bad thing for them. Mm. And, and so these are the kinds of symptoms. The problem is these symptoms, especially early on, mm. can mean anything. So you examine a patient who comes to you and says, I'm very, very tired. Uh, and you find nothing clinically. And until you do that MRI scan, you could be diagnosing them with many different things. Well, talk so about diagnosis. How, yeah. how, I mean, you did say that it, it's not an easy So uh, early on, it's not yeah? easy. Right. It's really not easy. Because you, you, you get patients who have symptoms and no clinical signs. Mm. So, you know, medicine, we look for signs. Mm. We listen to the symptoms. Until mm. there are signs, we, the we red don't bells don't, don't go off in our brains. Mm. And so you look at this patient who's got all these typical symptoms and, and you see nothing clinically. Mm. So you're stuck. But then as your experience comes, you realize, now maybe I should look further. So right. you look further. And your first step in diagnosis is the MRI scan of the brain. So the CAT scans don't help, any other scans don't help, it's the MRI scan. The reason is that the MRI scan shows lesions in what we call the white matter, right? And we said in MS it's an autoimmune disease. Mm. And the autoimmune disease affects the white matter or the myelin mm. of the brain and the spinal cord and the optic nerves. Right. So that's the only place you're going to see this. Okay. So you see those little white spots in the brain. Once you see that, you're now alerted. You then have to follow this up. And you do several other tests, mostly what we call electrophysiological tests. Yeah. And the final test we do is the lumbar puncture. Right. And in the lumbar puncture, we look for what we call oligoclonal antibodies, mm. which is like an Im immune marker. Mm. So if you take those three, and if two out of the three are positive, your likelihood of MS is almost certain. Right. So, so that's, that's quite technical, obviously. Mm. Um, now... In terms of progression, or maybe talking about symptoms and, mm. and progression and, and prognosis, in fact, going further, we told that there's different types yeah. of, of MS. Okay, so, so generally speaking, the first time you get an attack of MS, we, we call it the isolated syndrome or, or the clinically isolated syndrome, right. CIS. You can also get what we call radiologically isolated syndromes. So it's someone who comes with headaches, we do an MRI which looks like MS, so, and they've got no symptoms. So those are what we call early, 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 early diagnosis. Mm. Radiologically isolated syndrome, clinically isolated syndrome. Now in the clinically isolated syndrome, you've had one attack or your first attack. And you've got a positive MRI scan. This is then followed by the classical stages of MS, where from one attack you start getting multiple attacks. So you, you get what we call relapses and remittances. So we call it the RRMS. Mm. This, if it's left unchecked, even with treatment, can go on to what we call secondary progressive MS, the SPMS. Mm. And then you get progressive MS or primary. So the progressive MS is a secondary progressive or primary progressive. And these are the few unfortunate patients who from the word go, no matter what you do, just continue to progress. Mm. Mm. So, but the big group in this is the remitting relapsing MS. That's important because that's the group that's very treatable.
Okay, one, one last question in the segment. I mean, what, what is the prognosis? Is it a fatal disease? Is, so, is it called a terminal illness? So what, what? there are two, two things in terms of that. One, since we started what we call disease-modifying treatments, there are fewer patients in wheelchairs with MS. Two, if you take the lifespan of patients with MS, it is marginally reduced, maybe by 5 to 10 years, compared to uh, age match controls. Mm. So the disease itself does not seem to kill you. Mm. It's the effects of the disease. All right. It's a good point to end this, or this discussion on. We're taking a quick commercial break. When we come back, we continue our discussion on MS. Please stay with us. Seven Bryce Peas SABC News. Look. Paul Barber, SABC News, London. Debo Mokobo, SABC, Ufa, Kotamono, Russia. Neha Punya, SABC News, Saharanpur in Uttar Pradesh in India. Other than that, I've enjoyed every single moment of it. SABC News, Soweto, Johannesburg. Welcome back. We're talking multiple sclerosis or MS with a special guest, Professor Girish Modi. And we're trying to understand or unpack what this actually means. And, and, and uh, Prof, let's now talk about risk factors. Uh, you know, we, we've described what this illness is and how common it is and yeah. so on. Who gets it? So it, it's common in women. Yeah. Like, it's an interesting thing that if you look at all the autoimmune diseases, mm. somehow the good Lord decided autoimmune diseases goes to women <laughs> more than men. So there's right. a pro greater uh, prevalence amongst women. Right. The age group is where we diagnose it. It may, may, be, it may be there before, and we do diagnose it in young adults or young children. But the general age group, 20 to 40, mm. that's when you'll pick it up. So those are the things. In the Western world, in those countries we talked about where it's very common, it's considered the commonest cause of a paralysis, hemiplegia, yeah. in a young adult between the ages of 20 to 40. Right. So it's very common there. Yeah. It's not as common with us in South Africa, yeah. but it's still uh, a disease we look out for. So, uh, so two interesting things you mentioned earlier. The environmental aspect, you know, when you spoke about the climate. And, and, but perhaps before we get to the environmental aspects, let's, let's just stick to the genetic factors. Yeah. Uh, there appears to be a strong So there, there definitely is a genetic factor. Yeah. We know that it's commoner in families. So if you've got a first degree relative who has MS, your risk is about double the rest of the population. If we look at twin studies, then identical twins uh, should have the same risk, but it's not exactly the same risk. Mm. There's a 30% higher risk in an identical twin. It's not 100%. Mm. So there are definitely familial and, risk and, and genetic risk factors, but there are also other factors that, that are, are present. And we are not completely sure about these. So the biggest thing has been a viral infection in childhood, and there's been millions of dollars put into research on Epstein-Barr virus. Mm. But nothing's come out. So 
I always have this feeling. You spend so much money trying to find something, you don't get the answer, move on. Yeah. But we, yeah. we, we stuck on that. But I guess and the interesting thing then about, or interesting question, <coughs> you know, on, on the issue of genetics is somebody who's at high risk, and I mean, at this day and age where we have, you know, uh, sure. genetic testing available to us, <coughs> what are the implications? If, if, if no. you know. So it's not that kind of genetics. Yeah. So this is a little bit of what we call epigenetics, where there is a gene, but there's an environmental factor that maybe that triggers, triggers it. Yeah. So it's not the same thing as, you know, saying Huntington's disease, mm. where you know that if your first degree relative has it, your risk is quite high and you have to test. It's not the same thing. Right. The problem is we don't know what the gene is, Okay. number one. And so what test do we do? The only thing you can do, and I think that's not a bad thing, it's not a great thing, but not a bad thing, is if your first degree relative, your brother, your sister, or your parent has MS, it might be worth doing an MRI to just check if you are also there. So but that won't exclude it, yeah. it won't conclude anything, sure. but it may, if you've got strange symptoms, it may comfort you. I think that's what it would do. Mm, mm, mm. And, and let's t talk about environmental f factors? So amongst the environmental factors, we, we know that, like I told you about the geography, mm -hmm. that it seems to be that in, in these certain places there's a higher prevalence. We don't know why. Uh, we know that it, it seems to have started after the Industrial Revolution, and so we don't know whether there's some environmental factor like lead or whatever, yeah. but never been proven. Uh, the virus theory still holds strong. We know that where you see MS in, in the non-European countries, mm. it's usually due to some migration of the gene to that country. And so there was a famous neurologist in South Africa called Jeffrey Dean who spoke about how the Dutch and the English brought MS to South Africa. Mm. We have also have examples of, for instance, the Persians in Iran. When they went to Mumbai, they seem to have taken their MS risk to Mumbai. So you go to India and you don't see much MS, but you see a big pocket amongst the Parsis in India mm. who are of Persian derivative. So right. there is something about that. Yeah. If you go back in history, people think the Vikings moved MS from Northern Europe to America. Yeah. Just, just so, in case there might be confusion out there, let's just get this straight. Yeah. You're talking about people bringing MS to South Africa. This is not a contagious condition. No, 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 you no, can't no, no, no. I'm talking about historically. Else. Right. as a migration. Right. So during the voyages of discovery and during colonization, that's what yeah. I'm talking about. Right. This is, first and foremost, we said it's an autoimmune disease. Correct. You we do not know what causes it, but we know your immune system is attacking it. Right. It is not transmissible by any forms, either physical or otherwise. Right. Even if you get a blood transfusion from a patient with MS, it's very unlikely you're going to get MS. Right. So... We, t we talk about, or at least we hear about triggers for, for people who already have MS. Yeah. Uh, you know, triggers of... Uh, relapses. You know, relapses yeah. and flare-ups. Yeah. So, and so, so the one thing, like all autoimmune diseases, stress is a big trigger. And we find that people, especially when they go through... I, I suppose the, the, the explanation, the simple explanation there is like this. If you're very happy, you're very unlikely to get a flu. <laughs> right? Generally, generally, when we go through the winter months, we become yeah. a bit unhappy, and so yeah. that's when the flu season starts. Right. So, uh, when, when people are happy, they're not really sick. Yeah. And I think that's what stress is all about. Mm. So, I think the stress factors, the fact that you're not sleeping well, the fact that you don't eat well, or maybe you're smoking, or maybe you're drinking, those things have been shown to increase the risk of a relapse. Right. Right. But all of these, which you can argue this way or that way, the one thing that is clearly linked to a relapse is increase of body, core body temperature. So all MS patients should not increase their core body temperature, which means do not go into a sauna, do not go for a steam bath, and when you do bath, have a shower mm. and keep the doors open. Because increasing your body temperature seems to be a big trigger for a relapse. What about hot weather conditions? So, uh, I mean, you don't really sweat that much, but it can be a trigger. Mm. I had a patient who, was, who used to, his room for some reason in the old flat, he was near a boiler and it used to, his room was very hot. And 
he always got these attacks and we used to say change the room and eventually changed the room and he did reduce. So uh, heat is a very important factor. Right, right. I, I just want to go back to one issue that was raised in one of the clips um, where someone said that, you know, obviously referring to some test, yeah. that a test is available. I'm sure this is MRI yeah, yeah. test. Is there any benefit in early diagnosis? Not, not really. You know, once you've been diagnosed with MS, you have two treatments that are available. The one is the treatment of the acute attack. And the reason we do that is to try and reduce that inflammation in the brain and that scar tissue must try and reduce it as much as possible from forming, mm. right? And so cortisone treatment by eye intravenous uh, through your vein, intravenous yeah. uh, cortisone is the way to go. Sometimes in very aggressive conditions, we could even use plasma exchange, right. where you know, try and remove the antibodies. And then following that are the disease-modifying treatments, mm. the so-called interferons, the glatterum acetate, and the newer oral, inter uh, oral uh, therapies okay. that we've got. We can discuss that. Okay. And so, you know, will early diagnosis make a difference? Unless we had an agent that could stop it, yes. Mm. Currently, I'm not sure. Mm. Okay. Maybe this is a good point to live it. And when we come back, we try and understand how MS impacts other people's lives. Please stay with us. Saturday and Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. If you've just joined us, we're talking multiple sclerosis or MS. And with me in, in our Johannesburg studio is Professor Girish Modi, Head of Neurology at um, Vets University and Chris, Bar Har Chris Hani Baragwanath Hospital. <laughs> Tongue twisters. Tongue twisters. <laughs> and we're now joined by two other special guests. First up is Sh Shireen Dupree. Now, Shireen is the Inland Chairperson of Multiple Sclerosis South Africa, or just MSSA. Welcome to Health Talk, Shireen. Thank you, Doc. All right. And uh, we also have with us Brian Eads. Brian is um, a person living with MS who's going to share his personal story with us. Welcome to Health Talk, Brian. Good morning, Doctor. Thank you very much. All right. Perhaps let's start with Shireen. Yes. MSSA. What, what is, just briefly tell us what this organization is about, what, what do you guys do? Yeah, um, what we do is, uh, our mission is to try and uh, improve the lives of people living with MS and right. their caregivers mm. by empowering them with knowledge, information, and um, try to assist them with, um, with ass uh, medical assistance where needed. Right. Okay, we also, they also have... Um, self-support groups where they can be in contact with one another, right. share experiences and okay. such. We also try to raise funds to help those who, who cannot afford the medication. Right. What about the families of those people affected or living with MS? Yeah. Um, we also, we, we, we do training yeah. um, for the caregivers. Right. And 
most of the time we find that, you know, the families are the real sufferers. Right. Yeah. And we believe that you're also living with MS. I right? am, yes. right. I'm going to come back to you and ask you to please just share your story with okay, us. Okay, will do. Let's come to Brian. Brian, um, we told that you've been living with MS for, for a while now. Just, just, just tell us, you know, briefly how this started. When were you diagnosed with MS? Yes, Doctor, I've had it for, for about 18 years now, so I was uh, diagnosed in early 2000. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I'd had it for a very long time before that. Mm. Um, I was always quite a sports person, mm. uh, never very good, um, <laughs> but it got re re worse and worse, particularly ball sports. Right. My coordination just got really out of control. Um, All right. And the weakness. Okay, we'll, we'll get to sports now. Let's just get back to 18 years ago now. What, what is it that prompted you to go and consult a doctor? To, to, what, did you, what did you realize in your own body that said, you know what, <coughs> I need to go and consult a doctor? <coughs> I think general physic, physical weakness was, was a, a major thing. Right. But weakness in my limbs and numbness in my extremities, so in my fingers, right. uh, in my feet, right. uh, were, were, were massive. Okay. Um, for example, when I was walking, my, my left leg was dragging a lot. Right. Um, my hand was falling off, my left hand was falling off uh, my, my desk when I was working on my laptop. Yeah. So uh, I realized there was something wrong. Yeah. Um, but I mean, And how long did it, did it take them to tell you what's wrong with you? Uh, was it almost immediate? My diagnosis was, was immediate once I saw a doctor. Right. But being in corporate business, uh, always too busy to see doctors. Right. So I didn't go for, for a long time. And, uh, but when I did go, I went first of all to a neurosurgeon. Yeah. He took one look at me and sent me for MRI. Okay. Um, the same day, yeah. um, when, I, when I came out of the MRI, the same day they, there was two neurologists and, and a, a neurosurgeon. Right. And they, they were convinced. They said to me, you've got MS. Right. And I looked at them like... They were talking some other language because I didn't know what it was. Because I was going to ask you whether or not you knew anything about MS at that time. Nothing whatsoever. Right. I, I knew nothing whatsoever. What did it mean to you? <coughs> well, the doctor said to me, don't read books. Right. Um, because they are very, very bad stories in, in the books. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I didn't know what to do. My wife read a few books and she, threw, she burnt them. <laughs> she wouldn't let me read them. So I was very nervous. Um, I went to a few meetings at the MS Society, and the majority of the people in those days that had been diagnosed before were in wheelchairs or walking with, with, with walking sticks. Mm. So I was very, very nervous about my future, okay. um, and I didn't know what to expect. Right. So, so let's understand then how it impacted your life. You say that you were quite active in sports, and uh, this started affecting your ability to perform sports, correct? Yes, it affected my ability to, to, to do sports, particularly yeah. um, my golf. Yeah. You know, one of the big things um, is coordination. Mm. And coordinating a, a ball or a club, like a golf club, mm. uh, it's a long way from, from your hands. Yeah. So I could hit a golf ball in all directions except straight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I can tell you a lot of us do that. <laughs> 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 Even without it. <laughs> A squash ball, I could, I could hit a squash ball coming back at me, yeah. but I couldn't serve it. So if I threw it up in the air, right. my coordination wasn't good enough to, to judge it and serve right. it. But it was coming back at me, I could. I, so the other guy always had to serve to me, then I could right. play. Right. Um, which I lost points all the time, and that yeah. meant he was serving. Okay. And then other things like um, my running got, got really uh, odd. People used to say, but you run funny. <laughs> you know? mm. And... Mm. You know, I had no idea what all of these things meant. Um, right. I thought I was just getting worse at things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually realized that it was more than just, more than just getting older and getting worse. Right. Um, I, I actually had something wrong. And therefore, I went to, to, see, uh, to see the neuro, neurosurgeon. I thought yeah. there was something wrong in my neck. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that the brain stem uh, is a lot of that is in your neck. Yeah. So I didn't know what it was. I just yeah. felt it was coming from there. Okay. Um, and, and did your symptoms get worse over time? I'll, I'll ask you about treat, what treatment you had just now, but just in terms of your symptoms. You know, symptoms come and go. Right. Um, so in the beginning, my symptoms were extremely bad. Mm. Um, I went on to, because as I say, I don't know how long I'd had it, maybe years, and I'd had lots of relapses over the, that period. I don't know how, how long, but, um, sorry. Yeah. Maybe let's come back to your occupation now. Did it affect your occupation at any point? I think.
there's no doubt it affected my occupation. Mm. Um, I was diagnosed, when I was diagnosed, I was a senior general manager of marketing, mm. uh, mostly doing planning mm. in a major motor, motor manufacturer in South Africa. Right. So I was traveling internationally a lot right. uh, and locally uh, a lot more right. um, to, the, to our factory. And I was doing a lot of presentations. Um, in the beginning, I, I think it, it made me work harder Right. And made me made me challenge it at every at every stage. Right. Later on, um, it, uh, you get to a point where you stop worrying about important things. Right. So that had a serious effect on me, right. um, and the inability to to do presentations to huge crowds. You know, I started getting the shakes, uh, right. my leg particularly, and my hands. Mm. And I was always a very confident person. I could do that. Right. But I got to a point where it really affected my ability. Um, uh, in terms of that sort of thing, in terms of looking after a big staff um, and huge budgets, right. I, I, um, I got to a point where I always looked after the staff, but the budgets don't worry so much. Yeah. And of course, corporates do worry about budgets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Let's come back to, to Shireen. Shireen, you also have had it for, for a while. Now. Just give, give yes. us a short sense of uh, you know, yeah. your journey. I was positively diagnosed in 2006. Right. And like Brian, I didn't know what <laughs> MS is about because um, the ne uh, neurologist who di diagnosed me, he came, when he came to give me the news, he came with a clinical psychologist. Mm. And I just couldn't understand why he feels I need to be counseled. Mm. But when I was discharged, I did a lot of research and uh, so I've learned what it was about. Mm. But I decided not to let it get to me, so I tried to manage the MS with good nutrition, with exercise, and trying not to stress. Right. And that carried on for about four or five years. Also, I held this, a senior position at uh, uh, fin uh, one of these huge uh, financial institutions. Also, lots of <coughs> stress at work. Mm -hmm. And um, but afterwards, I have to. I chose to resign. And. Then, about a year after that, I had a lot of relapses. Mm. Yeah, landed up in hospital. And I used to have, to, I had to go for um, cortisone treatments, like for each, each month I had to go for five days for cortisone treatments. And fortunately, Professor Modi <laughs> came around one day at the hospitals and he was attending to me. And... Um, because of his involvement with my situation, I was fortunate enough to be placed on interferon. Mm. And for the past four years, I have not had a relapse. Okay. Prof, I thought I must give them enough time sure. to just share their no, story no, with us. Story. But, but I'd like us to pick up on one or two aspects, but perhaps not, not now, but in the next minute, just for you to, to think about. Firstly, the issue of access to diagnosis in the public sector, because I would imagine you know, easy access to MRI scans may be a problem. And, and secondly, I suppose, access to treatment. treatment yeah. But we're going to talk we'll about that after the short sure. break. Time for a quick commercial break. When we come back, we talk treatment. Please stay with us. Western Cape needs national government to fulfill its mandate on ensuring a bulk water supply. We must ensure that the city of Cape Town never confronts this particular situation again. The ESCOM is serious about stamping out corruption, which is why uh, the market is now beginning to, to accommodate us. Look at the neighboring countries expecting Botswana just to see partly cloudy skies with a half 34 in Khaboron. News today at 3 p.m. from Monday to Friday on SABC News.
give you a front row seat to all the local and international entertainment news on trends every Saturday from 12 to 1. Welcome back. We're talking MS with um, Prof. Girish Moody, Professor of Neurology at Worth University. And we have Shireen Dupree from uh, MSSA and Brian Eads, a person living with MS. Now let's get start with you, Prof. Um, we, you know, just to pick up on those two issues that I spoke about before we talk treatment principles. Just access to diagnosis. How easy is diagnosis in the public sector? Okay, so it's gotten to the point where I don't think it matters whether you're in public or private. Right. The diagnosis can now be made. If you take all the tertiary institutions in the country, in the public sector, we have MRIs. Right. So uh, in terms of the diagnostic tools, we have them, mm -hmm. both public and private. Right. It's the ease with which you can do it. It's much quicker in the private sector right. than in the public sector because right. we have longer waiting lists for MRIs. Right. But generally, you know, doctors, we get around things. When we really want to make a diagnosis, yeah. we right. can get to it. Right. So I don't think there's a disadvantage in terms of whether you're in public or private in terms of the diagnosis. Right. In terms of the treatment, the good news for MS sufferers is it's been declared a PMB condition, right. which means you should have access to treatment in both public and private sectors. If, if you're on a medical If you're on a... No, no, no. I'm well, talking well, about public okay. and private. Okay. So right. you are entitled to treatments in the public sector. Right. It's a little bit more difficult and one motivates more strongly, et cetera, et cetera. But we have started getting patients on the disease-modifying treatments in the public sector. Okay. Talk about treatment, though. What are the, mm. what are the principles? So the broad treatment? principles of treatment we alluded to earlier, the relapses, it's quite simple. Cortisone or the solumedrol drips intravenously for five days to try and reduce that inflammation in the brain. In the very severe instances, and sometimes you get what we call these fulminant attacks of MS, we use plasma exchange. It's quite uncommon. The main one is the cortisone drips. Mm -hmm. right? Then you have to disease modify. The minute you've made the diagnosis, after that attack, you have to disease modify. And so that's where we come in. Now, because of the costs involved, there have been guidelines. For instance, the South African guidelines, two attacks before you do disease modifying. Certain countries, the first attack and you do disease modifying. Mm. But I think that's largely, uh, it's not as scientific, but largely a commercially based guideline. Yeah, in uh, simple terms, for the sake of our viewers, what do you mean by disease modifying? Okay, so disease modifying is treatment that will prevent relapses and remissions and, uh, uh, and promote remissions. And you see, the one thing we need to understand, in MS, there is an autoimmune inflammatory process in your brain and spinal cord. It is there all the time. That's the evidence. Mm -hmm. The only time we as clinicians and you as a patient know that you have this is when you get an attack. Mm -hmm. So if we had to draw a baseline in the bottom there's continuous inflammation. When that inflammation reaches above the baseline, that's when you know something's wrong. Mm. That's when you become numb. That's when you lose vision. That's when you lose balance. That's the attack. So the first is to drop that attack back to baseline and try and reduce this inflammation so it doesn't shoot up. Mm. And that's the disease modifying treatment. Okay. And so, and, and this, I mean, the evidence is phenomenal that you must do this, okay. right? And the interferons started in 1994, so we have at least 20 years' experience with this, and they have definitely been shown to change the natural history of the disease. Yeah. So, so is it long-term treatment? Long-term, lifelong treatment. So right. it's like Brian was saying, 
that when he first went to his MS meeting, everybody was in a wheelchair. Now, if you go to an MS meeting, more than half are not. It's only the very senior guys that are. You see, so if you take a 25-year period on follow-up with MS, yeah. more people are mobile with these drugs. So they change the history of the disease. Okay. And there are various ones. There's the interferons, and there are three different types available. They're equally effective. There's a thing called glutarama acetate or copaxone, which is an equivalent form. And that's your first line. And that's what we start everybody with. And then when we see those things are not effective, we move to the second line treatments. And the second line treatments, and the reason we separate them is the second line treatments have risks with them. Mm. With the interference, your risk of cancer or anything is almost zero. With the second line treatments, you have higher risks of other things happening mm. besides improving your MS. Okay. And so therefore, we delayed for those that are now progressing. Okay, let's, let's, let's try and get a, a personal sense from people <laughs> living with, with the condition. What treatment have you been through? Um, well, I've been on the, the cortisone drip many times, but like I said, since I used the interferon, four years, uh, I started four years ago with it, I've not had a relapse. Mm. The only um, uh, <laughs> problem I had was when I had, I had some imbalance uh, in 2015, where I fell and broke my ankle both sides. Mm. And, but other than that, no other problems. Okay. And what about you, Brian? What treatments have you been on? Yes, also the, the cortisone treatment on every time I have a relapse. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, over time, I've had to go through periods where I've had lots of relapses. Mm. And then I go through periods where I hardly have a relapse. So mm. for the last 18 months, I've been relapse free, as far as I know. I'm not too sure. Yeah. So I do that, and I also do the beta interferons. It's a weekly injection. It is extremely expensive. Um, I've learned to inject myself over the 18 years. Mm. My wife cringes. She won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition but, 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 but it's fairly easy for you to stick to treatment, I imagine. Exactly. Yes, it's very easy exactly. to... Right. Sorry. Right. It's very right. easy to control it. And, of course, uh, one of the things that that is, is, is prevalent for me is, is mood swings and depression. Mm. So I take a medication for mood swings and depression um, and I use other uh, things to try and control that okay. such as light sport in right. cool conditions. And Prof, before we talk about you know, other lifestyle issues mood swings and depression yeah, yeah, are a fairly common thing? Very common. Also we talk of just the disease treatment then there are the symptoms treatment. Right. So the people who have the imbalance, you have to treat that. The people who have the spasticity, the stiffness, like the dragging of the legs, right. you have to give the baclofen for that. Yeah. And then they get depression, and you have to treat that. You have to treat the anxiety. You know, there are various things. The, the sexual dysfunction that you have to treat. So it's a holistic treatment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's where the psychiatrist sometimes comes in, the psychologist comes in. Yeah. And so we, we sometimes just sort of, as doctors, only think boom, 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 and done. But there's a whole patient, remember. And there are symptoms of that patient that we have to deal with right. as well. Lifestyle issues. Let's start with nutrition. Yeah. A lot has been written around vitamin D. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it doesn't, deficiency of vitamin D does not cause MS. Yeah. But there is now evidence, good evidence, that vitamin D should uh, help you with your relapses. Mm -hmm. So all patients with MS should be on vitamin D. Whether, obviously, don't overdo it and then you get uh, kidney stones, but <laughs> be careful about how you monitor it. Your doctor must help you with that. Mm. The other thing is, uh, in terms of diet, stay away from the, the red meats uh, and all of it. You know, the same principles that involve becoming healthy, mm. right? Eat a lot of fish. Uh, the omegas are important. Now, the whole long chain fatty acid story came about because if you take the Eskimos, they just don't get MS, right? I don't know how they've been tested, but they just don't get MS, <laughs> right? Yeah. And because they eat fish, they live on fish. Could, 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 could the climate have anything, have anything to do with But they live up north, eh? North yeah, Pole, yeah. South mm. Pole, so, yeah. you know, yeah. um, uh, that's where it's supposed to happen. So there is some protective factor there. They, there possibly is. And so we always right. encourage the patients. It's not evidence-based, but it's good, it's good to, to live well and, and be healthy. And well, like let's I understand said. from that. Do you guys live well, healthy? <laughs> yes, we try to. Ah, we try to. We stay. Brian belongs to a walk for life. Yeah. I also walk every day. Right. And yeah, <coughs> keep going. I think it does help your general. You see, once you have a, a good sense of well-being right. in these autoimmune diseases, yeah. depression is something that triggers relapses. Yeah. 
Uh, so what about physical activity? I mean, I would imagine sometimes there's limitations. There are limitations. Right? Yeah, look, there are patients who have like the secondary progressive MS patients have spasticity, ataxia. Don't go and try and jog and run the 702, whatever, walk for life or marathon. You will have problems. Mm. Mm. And like I said, do not increase that core body temperature. That yeah. is quite essential. Right, right, right. <coughs> but at least it, it pays off for, for trying to be active uh, Absolutely. on a regular you know, basis. Yeah. I, I found that water aerobics, aqua aerobics is very good because it does yeah. control the temperature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I do, but I also do a lot of walking. But I try to walk at cool times. Uh, it does raise my body temperature slightly. Um, and that makes my eyes go a bit fuzzy. Uh, but um, I do try and avoid getting really hot. Mm. I, you take, uh, I have clothes that keep me cool, um, a cap and scarf and a jacket, which are cooling clothes, and that right. does help keep my temperature down. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I think the physical well-being is, is, is very important for me. Right. Um, mm. And the mental strength. Um, I don't know how to exercise my brain, yeah. but <laughs> the mental strength <laughs> seems to work quite well. well we, we've been doing that quite, <laughs> quite, quite, quite effectively in the last few minutes. Yeah. Anyway. I I'm, I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to leave it, unfortunately, that we've run out of time. But, but yes, uh, Brian Eads, uh, Shereen <laughs> Dupree, and of course, Prof. Uh, Girish Moody. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Thank you, very, Thank much. you. All right. Thank you very much. So, folks, that's all we have for you today. We're back with you again next week, same time. We're back on your screens. And remember, if you've missed any of our previous shows, you can always download them from YouTube. I'm Dr. Silla McDowell. And until next week, please do take care. should never be just talk. So, make this my choice. SMS medical paid to 33023.